Hello everyone, welcome back. Justin here from JSG Watches and this is video number three. Video number three, three already. Today we have a Caravelle from the 1970s and it's got this nice style. It's got a Pacific University Senior Athletic Award on the front there. So this looks like it was a gift, possibly. But once put on the time grapher, we can look at it and this watch is looking like it's from the 70s. Um, it's not running the greatest, to be honest. So let us see what we can do about that. Maybe it's just old. Maybe we, maybe it just needs a service. Let's hope so. So what we'll do is we're going to take the movement out of the case and we will dismantle this thing. See if there's anything wrong with it or see if it is just gunked up with some old grease, some old oil. So again, same like normal. I'll take this movement ring out first, which just secures the movement within the case to stop it from wiggling around. And whilst I do that, let's have a look at Caravelle as a, as a business. Let's have a look at Caravelle as a watch company. Who are Caravelle? A brief Google search. Caravelle actually falls under the Bulova brand. So Bulova being the parent company, Caravelle being a subsidiary of Bulova. Caravelle being a cheaper, Caravelle being a cheaper, a cheaper model, really. So Caravelle models, what they have is they, they typically use Japanese or Chinese movements, so they're not the most expensive of watches, but they're, they do have quite a good reputation for surviving. So they're not the worst watches in the world, but they're just not the most expensive either. And as we can see on this one, this one's only a, this one's only a seven jeweled, seven jeweled movement. So this one's called um, a Bulova 11 DP. It's also used. This one's made in, which is made in Japan, and it's also used in some Citizen watches, I believe, some of the older Citizens. But this one only seven jewels, so not the most expensive of movements. But on the time grapher, it wasn't running horrendous. Maybe it just needs a clean. We shall see. I'm just removing the balance here just to get it out of the way first because I don't want to put my finger on that balance wheel and damage the damage any pivots on that balance wheel. First things first, let's remove the delicate part, the, the balance wheel. Get this one out of the way, make sure it's in a nice secure place so that when we clean it, put it back together, hopefully it fires up again. So this watch we can see here, this one is a very simple watch. It's only got the, the standard hour, minute, seconds, hands, but it does have an additional complication, the additional calendar wheel. But now I have a bit of experience. So the last video I did, the Hell Bros, that one had a calendar wheel. So this is the second watch I've done with a calendar wheel. So I'm hoping this one will be as plain sailing as that one and won't throw me any surprises. But what I'm doing here is I'm just removing this calendar ring plate but I'm being very careful I know there's some springs underneath here which are not necessarily held down in any place they're just held under under their own tension held in place under their own tension so I'm just taking extra care just to make sure I don't make any of them springs fly off this being one of them so you see this tiny spring here um and what that does is that pushes this little arm here against the calendar ring to lock it into position. So when the calendar ring rotates, this is what snaps it into place. After that, we can start taking off some of the additional wheels for the calendar complication. I'm not too sure what these wheels are called. I should do a bit more research. Um, but I have been doing a bit more reading. For those of you that have just joined, this is something new to me. So this is... This is only my third video, which means it's only my fourth watch that I've that I've dismantled. So every day is a school day. I'm still learning on the job. Um, this is a hobby for me, so I'm not a professional watchmaker again, for those that don't know, but something that I enjoy, something that I, I like to get involved with and something I like to learn. So I have been doing some reading because I appreciate my last video, the Hell Bros one and the, and the Waltham watch before that. My knowledge of some of the watch parts is horrendous. It, it's horrendous. It's getting better by the week, but 
it's still not, it's still not great. But now I've done a bit of reading. Now I know. Now I've got a bit more confidence in what some of the what some of the watch parts are called. This part I'm removing there is actually the train train wheel bridge. So what that does that secures the train wheels in position. After that, we'll move on to the, this is part of the, the, the parts I'm removing now is part of the, part of the keyless works. So within a watch, although everything does work together in order to make everything run smoothly, um, there are sort of siloed parts and this part I'm removing at the minute, dismantling is part of the, the keyless works. So the keyless works is the, is the keyless works is everything that's connected to the, to the winding stem. So when you pull the crown out to set the time or you rotate the crown, this is a mechanical watch. When you wind the, the power, everything that is connected to that winding stem is part of the, the keyless works. So what we have here on the back end here, there's two small cogs, one being the crown wheel and one being the ratchet wheel, as well as a click that was in place. Um, but once they're off, we can remove this one called the barrel bridge. And you can see here, I couldn't quite get the ratchet wheel off. Um, so I'm gonna have to attack it another way. And I'm gonna use my, I'm gonna use my two levers here to just pry it off. And the reason I've used this silicon, silicon pad is because underneath that I can see the click spring, but I don't know where it is. And I don't want it to fall off uh, and fly away somewhere. So I'm just taking extra care. You see here, under there on the left, I'm just about to point, there's a spring. Uh, and we don't want that going flying, so I'm gonna be extra careful. I'm just gonna turn this around. And let's have a look, what's going on? Yes, there we go. So thankfully I didn't chuck this, this barrel bridge around because if that spring flew out, I wouldn't have had a hope in hell finding that. So let's take some care, let's take our time, secure it down and pinch it out. And there we go. No dramas on that one. So that one, a bit strange. Normally, normally this this is the ratchet wheel. Normally that one comes off quite easily, but that one seemed quite quite jammed. Um, not sure why, but I just had to attack that a different way. So moving on from the keyless works, what we have now is we have the train of wheels. So we got um, second wheel, third wheel, and a center wheel here, which I'll take out in sequence. And then we have the the crown wheel actually, when I took it off, it fell it fell underneath. It fell in the middle. So that was actually the, the screw for the for the crown wheel. These two parts again part of the keyless works. So we got the so these two parts called the winding pinion and the sliding pinion. So they again attached to the to the winding stem. Did I call it a winding pinion earlier? It's a winding stem. And then we have this this plate on top securing the center wheel in place and hiding the escape wheel. Now removing the pallet fork bridge. And the pallet fork, but again, need to be very careful with this part because the this pallet fork is tiny, and the pivots on this pallet fork, that part that just fell off to my right hand side, the pivots are, are they're less than a millimeter thin, so they could be quite easily damaged. So I'm just going to take extra care, give it a little inspection, but all looks okay, I'll put, and I'll put it in a tray just to make sure that it doesn't get damaged. 
So everything done on one side of the main plate, I'll flip it over and I'll continue with the, the keyless works on the other side. And the, the keyless works on this side, we've got a few more, a few more parts. So here I've got a plate which secures, I believe this wheel is called the minute wheel. So you've got the hour wheel, which would be in the middle, which goes over the, the cannon pinion. Then this would be the minute wheel. Then we have an, a setting wheel. and the setting lever spring. So this this screw here secures down this plate, but this plate is actually a spring. So it has, um, it has a slender part coming off of it, which connects to the setting lever, which snaps the setting lever into position. So that's what that means is when you pull the crown out to snap it to, to adjust the time on a watch, you feel that click. And that setting lever engages with the, the setting lever spring. This plate I, I just removed here. But then once that setting lever spring is out, underneath that is another spring, which have to be take extra care that it doesn't fly away. So that's actually the yoke spring and the yoke here. So these are the parts that engage with the sliding pinion and change the setting between winding the power up to, to give it power and then put, or pulling the crown out to, to change the time. But once they're removed, I can now remove the setting lever. Which seems to have this secondary piece, this thin little piece connected to it, which was screwed down. So I haven't seen that before. That one's new to me. But everything done. Disassembly done. That one was not so painful. That was quite easy. But having a visual inspection at this, we can see this is gunked up. This hasn't been serviced in a very long time. Once it's under the microscope, we can see clearly here, there is just a whole host of dried up oil and grease on this watch. So this thing, it's even on the pallet fork, you see that all that dried up oil just specks of crap everywhere. The hairspring looks in a nice shape, but again, there's blobs of dried up oil everywhere. So that would explain why this watch wasn't running the healthiest, but that can be solved. So what we're gonna do now is we will clean this whole watch. The whole thing will be cleaned and we will then start the reassembly. So now this thing has been run through the ultrasonic cleaner, we just put it under the microscope again, just to give it a, a quick visual, just to make sure that a lot of that grime is gone. And this thing's come up pretty nice. Um, I've mentioned in my previous videos that my cleaning method is not the most sophisticated. Um, not only the, the machine I use, I just use a, a very simple ultrasonic cleaner, um, but also the solutions I use. I, I, actually, I can only actually get lighter fluid, like Zippo lighter fluid, for the initial degrease and then just some high percentage IPA for the first rinse, second rinse. But up until now, the, all the watches I've done, that process seems to work, it seems to be okay. It's not the best, obviously, but it does clean the watches up. And we saw under the microscope there, it, do, it doesn't do a bad job. It doesn't do, the, do a horrendous job. It does enough. So now we can start the reassembly. So first of all, we've got the train of wheels here. and the bridge. Um, and this one, I just have to be careful that I align these wheels with these pivot holes. So them three brass holes on the top, I'm using my loop here just to make sure that everything is engaged and everything is in position before I screw this one down. Because the last thing I need to do is clamp this down when one of them wheels isn't in the correct position, damage the pivot, that would damage that wheel and this watch would not run unless I, one, repair the wheel, which I don't have the capability to do or I replace the wheel and trying to find a replacement for a watch in the, that was made in the 70s that is no longer being manufactured, probably not an easy task. So what I did there, I just checked everything before 
I pinched it down, pinched the two screws down, and everything is engaged, everything looks good. So now I can put the, the main barrel back on, as well as the barrel bridge. Uh, this one, a lot more simpler. This one, no, no tiny pivots to, to look after on this one. The main barrel held down here just with two screws. And I'm just gonna just gonna give the main barrel a flick just to make sure that it engages in all of the wheels. So you've got the main barrel, the centre wheel, third wheel, second wheel, and the escape wheel. So if you rotate one wheel, the everything should be connected. So nothing should be stood still. So if I turn the the barrel the power should go all the way through to the escape wheel, which we see, which is exactly what we want. Because we've washed this movement, what we need to do is we, we, need, we need to replace the, the, the oils and the greases. So I've got some 9010 going on the barrel arbor there. And this click spring going back into position. So the click spring I had to put on first because the ratchet wheel covers it. So if I put the ratchet wheel on, I'd have had to remove it and then put the spring back on. Um, but all looks okay. So now we've got the crown wheel ring as well as the crown wheel. And this is a reverse thread. This screw is actually a re reverse thread. You, you can typically tell by the pattern on top of the screw. The same as, this one's quite a weird one. So. Normally the ratchet wheel is a standard thread and the crown wheel reverse thread. But both of these wheels have the same pattern and they both they were both reverse thread, which is a first for me. Yes, I've only done four watches, but that doesn't seem common in a lot of the watches that I've watched video videos about myself. But maybe you've seen other watches that have the same thing. Let me know, comment down below. Um, have you seen other watches, other movements with reverse thread on both the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel? That'd be interesting to hear. On the other side of the watch, we've got the keyless works going back together here. And I'm using some D5 on the, on the winding pinion and the sliding pinion. Because D5, D5, the blue grease, is, is used for high friction areas. So especially on this winding stem as well. This one is high friction, so it goes through, it goes through a lot of abuse. Um, wound every day, every other day, and it's high friction part. So what we need is a thicker grease to make sure, one, it stays in position, and two, it just provides a lot more lubrication for them areas. But a lot of the posts for these intermediate wheels, the minute wheel, the hour wheel, that one would use some thinner, a thinner oil like a 9010. Same like the yoke I've just installed here. The post for the the yoke again, I've, I've used 9010 for this also. So the 9010, I use this red applicator. Cannon pinion going on now, and you'll hear a nice click. So that click just ensures that it is pressed home because that cannon pinion is just friction fit. It's not screwed down, it is just friction fit in position. And now for the tricky job of putting these springs back in. So some of these, the springs to take them out is never really an issue, but putting them in, sometimes they can be a nightmare. This one wasn't so bad, but I like to put the springs in last. I don't like to sp put the springs in first. So I put the spring in last and I put the covering plate on. So this set and lever spring, which is the plate that covers the yoke spring underneath. Once the, once the yoke spring was in, I put that set and lever spring plate straight on just to make sure that spring doesn't jump out at us. And I'll give it a quick check. Everything looks to be engaging, everything looks okay. So we can continue, oil up some, of the, some more of these posts with some 9010. 
and continue installing the, these wheels. So we've got the minute wheel there which is held in position with this retaining plate. That's just to ensure it doesn't jump out. To make sure that the, the teeth between the two cogs align. Because you could imagine if the alignment of any of these any of these wheels was to skip or miss, one was to raise above the other wheel, the power from the main barrel, the main spring, would just instantly release, which could cause more damage and damage a lot of these wheels. So some of these plates installed to ensure that doesn't happen. So it's quite a decent design actually. And I'm sure many revisions to, to get it right. Not something that you could design first go. One thing that any watchmaker can appreciate is on these videos, everything looks quite large. Um, but to film these, we use macro lenses. <laughs> um, and the parts on these watches are, they're a lot smaller than you would imagine. So just think this thing goes on your wrist. This watch is only um, around a 36 millimeter watch. And everything inside it is, a lot of the screws are sub one millimeter. Uh, the thickness of lot, all of these wheels is definitely sub one millimeter. They're tiny, they are extremely small. So the design of these watches, everything, everything needs to run smoothly and engage well, just to make sure that nothing gets damaged. But the reassembly is going well. We've got the, the keyless works back in. We're putting together the calendar complication here. And I'm just gonna check, I've just put one screw in, just to make sure that everything is engaging. So when I rotated and I pulled the, the crown out, I changed the time. And I was just checking that the calendar flipped over a day, which it did. So now I know that everything is okay. I can screw down this plate, this calendar wheel plate. Now I'm going to flip the watch back over. And this thing is almost ready to fire up and see if it's going to come back to life. Let's cross our fingers. It, I mean, it should do. It ran before, so it should run again. Um, but the question is how well? Have we improved it? Have we made it worse? Time will tell. We, we will find out. So the pallet fork going on here. This pallet fork, this pallet fork is the th is the is the part of a watch that actually makes the the ticking noise. So you've got a ticking noise when you hear a watch, you hear that. T -t 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 -t. And what that is is actually the pallet fork stones um, engaging with the escape wheel. So there, I was just I, I wound the watch a bit. I flipped the pallet fork over just to make sure that power was running through, and it it seemed like there was quite a decent bit of power there. So that gives us promise that we're on the right we're on the right track. So now for the most exciting part, reinstalling the balance wheel. And this is where we hope to see this thing fire up. But so far no good. What's going on? What you see there, you just see the balance wheel there. It's jammed. So that's what that means is that means the the impulse jewel is on the wrong side of the pallet fork. So I'm just going to rotate the watch, remove the balance wheel once more, and I'll just rotate and install it from the other direction. And hopefully this time it will fire up. Now that the impulse jewel is in the right position. Let's us oh, there she goes. She wants to run. It's running. Not, doesn't look too great though. The amplitude looks very low. But let's get the screw in. Let's see if this solves that issue. Whoa, there we go. That's what we want to see. Before, that balance wheel wasn't rotating much at all. But now that looks nice and healthy. That's a nice strong amplitude there. That's exactly what we want to see.
So now on to the remaining part. Flip the watch over again. Give the Canon pinion a little bit of 9010 oil. Put the hour wheel back on and the dial shim. And we can get this dial back on. And can I just say, I, I've said before, I'm not really a dial man, but this one, this one's my favorite. Out of the watches I have, this is my favorite. I like this one a lot. There's just something about it. I'm sure this watch has got a good story. So it would be interesting to know, Pacific University, for any American viewers out there that potentially went to university in the 70s, 80s, were watches typically given as gifts at university? Because this looks like it's an athletic award. I'd be interested to know, because I'm sure it wasn't just um, universities that give gifts like this. I'm sure some businesses would have done a similar thing. But it's just got some character about it, this one. I just really like it. Plus, it stood the test of time and it's looking really clean. It's looking really nice. The dial, I've had to do nothing to it. Just give it a blast of air. So the hands went on smoothly. We'll give the case a quick blast of air also, just to make sure no dust in the, in the case. And we can plop this movement back in. There we have it. So now the winding stem, we just align the winding, winding stem and click that back in. But before we press that one home, I'm gonna need to install that retaining ring. Here we go. So this one goes in one way. It's got a nice cutout for the, for the winding stem. I'll press this one, press this one home to, to secure the movement in place. Now we can push the, the crown in. And there we have it. So. Last thing to do, check this watch out. And it's, it's better. It's not amazing, but for a 70 year watch, the amplitude is far better than it was. The rate is far better than it was. The beat error is far better than it was. All in all, this has been improved drastically, but for the time being, this one's come back to life and should get some more years out of it yet. So to wrap up, all in all, I think this one was a success. Let me know your thoughts. Thanks for coming along. Thanks for sticking around. These videos are quite long, I understand. I hope you enjoy them as much as I enjoy making them because, yeah, they take, a, they take a bit of effort. If you enjoyed what you saw, please subscribe. Please comment what you liked, what you didn't like. Like the videos because it does help the channel. And if you're subscribed, you can get the alerts for any new videos that are coming up. So I typically try and get one video every two weeks. Thanks again for coming and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.